aspects of um, the history and operation of um, socialist movements in South Africa. I think that you will all understand that um, we sent out a call fairly broadly for papers and uh, what we've ended up with is um, partially uh, to do with um, who actually responded uh, and um, trying to work out a um, very tactful and generous um, way that um, is respectful to the speakers on this first panel that says we did look at uh, gender diversity across the whole of the program. Uh, and as organizers myself and my other colleagues are not unmindful of the fact um, that it, you know, uh, would have been nice to see a whole range of different diversities at work uh, in the conference. So welcome everyone. And I think we have a couple of um, Communist Party members on today. Welcome to you as well. Uh, I haven't been alerted um, to anyone in particular. So let me say um, in that time honored phrase, all protocol, all protocol observed, and, and hopefully that will cover um, all the necessary responses to everyone. I'm Natasha Erlank. I'm in the history department um, at the University of Johannesburg. And it's uh, my great pleasure to have um, with us today uh, some of uh, a set of very eminent um, historians who've written about South African history um, and the associated histories of Southern Africa in different ways. Uh, first up will be Henry D, who's in the International Studies Group at the University of the Free State. He's just finished his PhD on Clemens Kadali uh, and has been doing some really interesting work over the last couple of years on looking at uh, issues to do with the way in which uh, the ICU worked. Um, his PhD was uh, completed at Edinburgh, uh, and he'll be speaking um, on From Garvey to Lennon via Kadali, the ICU's ginger faction and the transformation of interwar black radicalism. Henry, just before I proceed, I'm going to introduce everyone um, so that I don't have to interrupt the program as we go along. Um, we also then have presenting today, um, uh, uh, who's not with us today, Sheridan Johns, uh, Professor Emeritus in Political Science um, at Duke University and a longtime Africanist known to many of us. Uh, Richard Mendelssohn, who's a Professor Emeritus at UCT and I have to say taught me when I was an undergraduate. And Lucien van der Velt, who's a Professor at, of Sociology at um, the university that doesn't seem to have managed to change its name yet that formerly and currently is still called Rhodes University, depending on um, what your politics are and where you're located. Um, and the, the uh, Richard and Lucien are going to be speaking about the political uh, odyssey of Solomon Bursky, South Africa, traversing the worlds of the IWW, the CPSA, Africana nationalism and the Jewish diaspora. Um, Peter Lim, who's Emeritus Professor, a former Africana bibliographer um, and general uh, all-round good South African historian, uh, formerly of Michigan State University, um, is going to be looking at the history of the Communist Party in the Free State. Um, I'm summarizing his title here. Uh, and Bob Edgar, who is hopefully still coming online, um, Professor Emeritus Howard, is going to be talking about Josie and Palmer. Uh, and the Communist Party of South Africa. And we'll take the papers in the order in which they appeared on the uh, program. So Henry, it's over to you. Well, thanks very much, Natasha. Um, yeah, thanks very much for organizing um, and Ariana and Lissoni for organizing and Prof Hislop for um, uh, acting as a discussant. And uh, Natasha, could I, could I share my screen? Is that okay? I've got slides. So. Yes, please go ahead. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Ah, so. Let's see. Um, do you want to start talking and I will see okay. what I can do about that? Yeah, 
Um, so the main focus of this paper is on a key group of black radicals uh, within Southern Africa's first major black trade union, the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union of Africa, or ICU for short. And they coalesced around a ginger faction from the mid 1920s. Um, the ICU's ginger faction were among the most outspoken leaders of the trade union, and they regularly led calls for general strikes at ICU annual conferences. At times, they were closely aligned with and influenced by the Communist Party of South Africa or CPSA. But in this paper, I want to think through and emphasize the multivalent direction of ideas and influence is between the ICU and Communist Party, how the strategies of both organizations were transformed by interactions between uh, key figures and how these interactions in turn reshaped the broader radical politics of interwar Southern Africa. And so to do so, I uh, first want to look at the worldviews of three figures in particular, Stanley Silwana, uh, Thomas Inbeki. Ah, cool, yeah, I can share the screen now. Uh, yeah, Thomas Mbeki, Stanley Sawana, and Cable Motte, um, who were key figures in the ICU's ginger faction and were heavily influenced by uh, biblical no uh, notions of race pride as well as syndicalist and communist ideas. Um, and second, I want to em emphasize how the ICU's successes and the trade union's particular or emphasis on black mass organization um, demonstrated the possibility, necessity and significance of organizing black workers in the hundreds of thousands at a transnational level. And most notably, the Communist Party's era defining Black Republic thesis written at the end of the 1920s was heavily shaped by ICU and Garveyite ideas of race consciousness, as well as comment and directives to uh, take over the union at the end of the decade. So the transnational spread of the ICU and its mass membership have been well documented in the scholarship of uh, Helen Bradford, Lucien van der Velt, Sylvia Neem, Robert Trent Vincent. And starting in Cape Town in 1919, um, by the mid 1920s, the trade union had branches across South Africa, reaching into Luderitz in Namibia, Missouri in Lesotho, and Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. And it had over 100,000 up to 250,000 members. Uh, today, however, I want to focus on the particular history of the ICU's ginger faction, uh, their backgrounds, their emergence as a political force within the ICU, their promotion of communist ideas in the mid-1920s, how they led a series of protests at the end of the decade, and finally, how their ideas resonated in subsequent decades after the collapse of the ICU in the 1920s. So what was the particular background to ICU gingerists? Probably the most famous ICU gingerist was this guy on the left here, uh, Thomas Mbeki, a young Kosovo radical who became the first secretary of the Bloemfontein ICU in 1923 before relocating to Johannesburg. And from 1925, he was branch secretary of the Pretoria ICU before working as provincial secretary for the whole of the Transvaal between 26 and 28. Stanley Sawana in the middle, uh, he joined the ICU first in uh, Johannesburg in late 1924 after working as a teacher and he then relocated to Cape Town in 1925 where he worked as an office clerk and secretary to the local ICU branch before he left the trade union in 27. And finally, Tebu Wilfred Cable Motte on the right, he joined the ICU in Bloemfontein in 1924 worked as a local organizing secretary before being promoted to a uh, provincial secretary of the whole of the free state between 26 and 28. So uh, these men are all under the leadership of Kadali and Champion, better known figures, but they were all leading figures within the ICU, especially at a provincial level. Nevertheless, at the same time, they also have ambiguous uh, political histories with Motte and Mbeki in particular, working as crown witnesses and even police informers at various stages of the 1920s. So very little information is available about Thomas Mbeki's background, although he was certainly uh, educated by Christian missionaries. Silwana and Motte, however, um, were both educated at the Anglican Church's Diocesan Teacher Training College in Polokwane at the start of the 1920s. It here, it's here that they appear to have engaged with the ideas of African-American, Booker T. Washington, and the West African uh, educator James Gard Agre. Uh, 
And through uh, progressive black circles, all three men also began writing for the newly published moderate uh, black newspaper Umtiteli Wabantu in the early 1920s. And it's through the pages of Umtiteli that we can first engage with their ideas. So Silwana uh, wrote, writes approvingly of uh, James Agri's politics um, and Agri continues to feature within ICU literature into the nine, late 1920s. Uh, Thomas and Becky and radicals such as Nimrod Kansi and John Manko in turn use the pages of Umtiteli uh, to advertise the launch of the ICU in Bloemfontein in 1923. And in Washington inspired language they advertise Kadali's visits to the Free State Town with slogans such as industrial organization is the only way to sweep out existing disabilities amongst African races. Uh, within ICU circles, however, more moderate ideas about educational improvement were also complemented with ideas of mass mobilization and black pride promoted by Marcus Garvey and his Universal Negro Improvement Association based out of New York, which had which claimed millions of members worldwide at the start of the 20s. And you have prominent Garveyite officials within the ICU include James Tiale on the left, James Gulen Gums in the center and Emmanuel Johnson on the right. So in ICU newspapers, um, you find um, the ICU's Assistant General Secretary and future communist James Laguma writing Garvey-inspired poetry, Ye Sons of Africa Arise. And you have Thomas and Becky who worked closely with Garveyite James Tiali in Pretoria asserting that, quote, a new race leadership must replace the old leadership and marshal the, marshal the dumb voiceless millions of our race to freedom. So these Garvey influenced ideas about black mass organization were central to the ICU's emphasis on the possibility, importance and potential of black self-organization and the urgent need for new militant black leadership. So the ICU's ginger faction first rise to prominence in mid 1920s Johannesburg. And it's here that they were at the forefront of a series of mass meetings in spaces such as Market Square pictured here and at the Inchcape Hall from late 1924. Um, and these meetings quickly led to the police arresting uh, Nibiron Tansi in October 24 and Thomas and Becky leading a march to the police headquarters at Marshall Square pictured here to protest for his release. Uh, it's also on the RAND that the first evidence emerges of the ICU's profound influence on white radicals within the Communist Party of South Africa. So Eddie Rue, for example, writes that he was profoundly influenced by the speeches of Silwana and Thomas and Becky in particular, and their organizations are black, about black organizations. So after hearing their speeches, Rue writes, he thought and cared less about Russia, the workers of the world, and all communist theories, and ever more about the national aspirations of the oppressed black of Africa. In turn, Cable, Mottin and Becky were increasingly influential within the ICU by 26, 27, and the Ginger faction gains increased prominence both within the ICU's newspaper, the Workers' Herald, and at ICU annual conferences. And it's at ICU annual conferences that the ICU Gingerist lead calls for strike action in response to repressive new legislation. So James Laguma calls for the ICU to emulate the Russian Revolution while in Becky tabled a motion for a general strike across South Africa. And ultimately these motions are defeated after leaders like Kadali argue that it's not viable to pull off a successful strike action uh, across South Africa. From 1925, nevertheless, a number of ICU gingerists become closely aligned and work with the Communist Party. And there's quite a lot written on certain ICU leaders who remain committed to the Communist Party, most notably, uh, Tibede, James Laguma, John Gomez and Eddie Kaile. Most ICU gingerists, however, notably had far more fleeting engagement with the Communist Party and have fallen outside of South Africa's documented radical tradition since. So by the mid 1920s, the ICU was increasingly prominent within the Communist Party's newspaper, The South African Worker, and these included articles on Thomas and Becky's speeches and Cable Motti's organizing tours. And numerous ICU leaders, including Kadali, in turn uh, invoke the Russian Revolution, and Laguma has a picture of Lenin on his living room wall. Uh, similarly, a portrait of Karl Marx is uh, hung up in the center of the ICU's workers' hall in central Johannesburg. And also, yeah, the, the uh, cartoons of colored artist James Christie Stott depict a black Samson toppling the twin pillars of imperial capitalism and racial prejudice. <clears throat> 
And it's through these interactions that the Communist Party takes up a new emphasis on the organisation of black workers from late 1924. And this was a change that was rejected by some white radicals such as Frank Glass, Bill Andrews and Harry Haynes. Glass, for example, argued that this change in policy meant that the party had abandoned white workers. And Bill Andrews continued to believe that white workers were the primary agent of social change in Southern Africa. So uh, for John Gomez, who was interviewed by Sylvia Neem in the 60s, however, the ICU fundamentally challenged these assumptions. Uh, Thomas and Becky similarly argues that uh, the black workers were the real proletariat of South Africa and they alone could save the day. So yeah, black workers were the revolutionary force within South Africa. Uh, the expansive solidarities espoused by the ICU also forced the ICU to change, it, sorry, this Communist Party to change its stance on the politics of migration. So ICU radicals like Thomas and Becky pictured here actively encouraged the organization of all black workers across the African continent, calling for the ICU to extend as far as Algeria at the same time as organizing um, local and immigrant workers in South Africa. In contrast, um, old school white radicals such as Andrews and Haynes uh, continued to argue that black immigrants from Central and Southern Africa, quote unquote, swamped South Africa and threatened uh, the country's so-called civilization. So you have enduring tensions and differences between the Communist Party and the ICU, and these spill out in at the end of 1926 over ICU finances, uh, whether the ICU should be an explicitly uh, revolutionary organization and uh, over personality differences. And these are pretty well documented. Um, and this leads to the expulsion of a number of communists at the end of 26. Most, no, no, nevertheless, most black radicals and revolutionaries elect to stay within the far larger organization, the ICU, and abandon their former connections with the Communist Party. Um, in this final section, though, I want to focus on these radicals who stayed within the ICU, uh, but nevertheless remained at the sort of the forefront of mass protests and strikes towards the end of the 1920s. So certainly in centres such as Durban and Johannesburg, more moderate ICU leaders fail and abandon a number of strikes. Uh, but in many instances, ICU gingerists do respond positively to a rising tide of working militancy at the end of the decade. Um, so, for example, Thomas and Becky pours a considerable amount of energy organising workers in uh, Middleburg, and after being arrested at least once, he successfully overturns a local ban on black people walking on pavements in the town. Um, subsequently, from 27 to 28, Cable Motti leads a rent strike amongst the black inhabitants of Kroonstad. And over the course of the strike, residents clock up over £4,000 in arrears, and the strike culminates in the failure well, yeah, it culminates in failure with the eviction of strikers, demolition of their homes and the arrest of Motte, but he remained an influential and popular local hero in Kroonstad into the 1950s. Finally, Motte was more successful in his involvement in the June 1928 strike at the Leichtenberg diamond diggings when over 30,000 black diggers drawn from across southern and central Africa downed tools in response to wage cuts in what was the second largest strike of black workers during the interwar period. And the ICU's exact role in mobilising workers is, is unclear, but in a recent VITS MA thesis, Lawrence Stewart has demonstrated how strikers vividly remembered being told to down tools by Motte and Kadali, while Motte himself uh, later claimed that he led the strike. And successfully, oh, significantly through ICU-led nego negotiations, workers did win briefly demands for 15 shilling a week pay, although the diggings themselves subsequently became exhausted soon after. So many of these radical ICU-led campaigns amounted to some of the largest uh, mass mobilizations of black workers in the interwar period and explicitly employed socialist ideas and in some instances won gains for workers. Nevertheless, indicative of wider problems within the trade union, both Mbeki and Motte left the ICU in part because of their notoriety as drinkers, womanizers and potential sellouts. And certainly Alexander Maduna, another ICU radical, uh, blamed the collapse of the ICU at the end of the 20s on excessive drinking, noting that uh, leaders didn't replicate the abstinence practice by Lenin and Trotsky. So what are the legacies of the ICU and its ginger faction in particular? Um, Mbeki uh, briefly returned to the fore as a deputy of Kadali's independent ICU in Johannesburg in the early 1920s, but he sunk into alcoholism and retreated from organising. Um, 
So Wana left the ICU and Communist Party and appears to have concentrated instead on teaching and writing children's stories in Mtuteliwa Bantu. And Mote became active within the moderate joint councils movement, working as a teacher under Mtuteli agents. So they all sort of fell out of radical politics. Nevertheless, a number of ICU leaders and members such as Albert Nzula, Doris Pierce, John Gomez, uh, James Schubert, Gilbert Cocker, Ghana Makabeni, and J.B. Marx would go on to become key figures within the Communist Party. And Communist Party newspapers often favorably invoked the ICU, uh, such as this cartoon from 1936. Uh, the ICU's sustained emphasis on black militant organization was also central to the IC Communist Party's Black Republic thesis, which was heavily influenced by former uh, IC leader James Laguma, pictured on the right, far right here. And at an international level, uh, the ICU had a profound impact on the thinking of Black Marxists such as CLR James and George Padmore, who were enthused at the ICU's mass mobilization, which they saw as a parallel to the Haitian Revolution. And so whilst numerous uh, studies recently have emphasized the global importance of Garveyism, notably uh, James and Padmore saw the ICU as a more significant and class conscious organization than Garvey's organization. I suppose so in doing so, the ICU's emphasis on race and the importance of black organization drew on global influences, but also profoundly shaped uh, the Communist Party and broader radical politics in Southern Africa uh, with, with, with global ramifications for decades to come. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, um, Henry. That was great. Um, we'll uh, uh, hang on to your questions until everyone's had a chance to speak. Uh, and just to say that while you've been speaking, um, or it could have been just before, uh, Bob Edgar joined us. Um, and so welcome, Bob. Uh, it's good to see you online. Um, we're going according to the order of the papers uh, that was uh, uh, sent out on the announcement. So next up we have, um, uh, in his absence, Sheridan Johns, Richard Mendelssohn and Lucien van der Volt um, presenting um, on the political odyssey of Solomon Bursky. And I'm going to turn it over to Richard and Lucien. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, then Richard will come in and talk about part of Solomon Bjorski's life, and I will come in again from there. I think it fits quite nicely after Henry's paper, which, uh, I mean, Henry's paper, is, as always, has the strength of, of letting us rethink organizations that are often seen as moribund, as failures, and parts of the history that are often seen as unimportant. In the same way, what we're trying to do here is to look at a particular figure in the Communist Party of South Africa, one not really well known these days, a, a charter member, an activist in it for a lot of his adult life, and the way that his story complicates what we think about the history of the party. So the story of, of Solomon Bjorski, who came from Lithuania, arrived in South Africa in 1913, in some ways is similar to the stories of people like Joe Slovo or Ray Alexander, but one of the things that makes him very interesting is he's got a much more complex odyssey. He's, he's active in the party, but he regularly defines con defies convention. He's very much his own man. I, I don't want to say maverick. I think he's quite an independent thinker, and he takes some quite unusual positions, and this allows us to have a, a richer view, um, I think, of local red lives, how radicalisms intersect, and... Um, in looking at the scope of his political engagements and his unorthodox positions, I think we, we get a sense of, of a somewhat richer um, history of, of communism and the left in South Africa. So I'm just going to talk a little bit to historiography and then, um, then Richard will come in. Now, why does it matter? I mean, why look at Solomon Bjorski? Why, why look at this one guy? I think it's important to understand his life significance, not just in its own terms, but in terms of what it means for our understanding of the history of communism and nationalism in South Africa. Obviously, the Communist Party of South Africa and its underground successor, the SACP, have had a lot of scholarly attention. There have been studies of the party's politics and ideology. 
There have been social histories that have looked at elements of the party's activities, and there's quite a strong vein of um, biographies. And on this, on this, uh, I see on Zoom, we also have Tom Lodge, who uh, I think um, is going to make quite a, a major contribution with his book just out, which is, I think, the first general history of the party. But before we get on to that, I think it's important to note that although the Communist Party has done very few studies of its own, the Communist Party's own view of its own history has deeply shaped academic work on the party. And the influence of the party's own interpretation of its history remains quite extraordinary. Now, according to this story, the history goes something like this. One, the party is founded. In 1921, radical white workers who were really sort of semi-Bolshevik or Bolsheviks in embryo set up the party. Two, the party ignores issues of race until 1924 when S.P. Bunting shifts the party. Three, the party finally takes the racial national question seriously in 1928 under Comintern and pressure with a two-stage strategy, uh, majority rule first, socialism later, also known as the Native Republic at the time. Four, it goes through a sectarian period, doesn't work with any reformists. Five, it starts to engage in popular fronts. And the great culminating moment of this is the alliance with the African National Congress, which remains in place today. Now, the problem with this approach to the history of the party and the story of the party's history, which comes really from the party, um, is it's very teleological. In other words, it structures the history of the party around an idea that it had a very clear end goal. It, it was teleological. The changes it had were inevitable, positive steps um, in, in a, a maturation of the party. There's a triumphal march culminating in the ANC SACP alliance. And this is something which um, really sets up a lot of the legitimacy for the party in the sense that the party matured, it took the right decisions, everything it did was building towards the right decisions and the decisions made in the end were the right ones. Now, there's a, there are a couple of problems with this and I'll indicate how Bjorski affects that a bit. First, in looking at the history of the party from its current uh, point of view and its current politics, um, it tends to render current positions of the party sacrosanct. They have the imprimatur of history. They are sanctioned by grand historical processes and they were obvious, positive and necessary. Secondly, it requires to do this a very simplified, often demonstrably misleading history of the party. For example, the formation of the alliance with the ANC was by no means a, a, a foregone goal. Even when the Communist Party adopted the Native Republic, it did not work with ANC as a priority. Uh, in the early years of the Native Republic, you could be expelled from the Communist Party for working with the ANC. Later than that, when the Communist Party started to move into popular fronts, again, there was a lot of skepticism towards the ANC. And in fact, people like General Secretary Moses Katani proposed cooperation with the Afrikaner National Party and not with the ANC. So th those are a few points I want to make there. Now, biographies like those of Bjorski can provide a very important corrective to these simplified triumphalist teleological accounts, particularly accounts that present the views of one faction, i.e. the faction that supported the alliance with the ANC as a priority, um, as, as not just a view, but as inexorable historical decisions that are grand triumphs. As John Hislop's study of J.T. Bain has shown, biographies can indicate something different. The importance of personal choices, the contradictions and complexity of the choices that people make in complex situations, the ways that individuals grapple with larger processes and pressures, and how organizations like the CPSA and the SACP were not these monolithic um, uh, structures that operated in some sort of neat way. Now, we could say there are some biographies that help us to, to complicate the story of the party, but most biographies of party leaders, um, most biographies of people in the party are those of very, very prominent leaders and actually a very select bunch. There are people like Lazar Bach, Moses Mabida, uh, Alfred and Zula, Jimmy Shields, who've never actually been studied. Now, if we look at somebody like Bjorski, he provides a way of doing this that complicates the story. 
And we're able to do this uh, first because Bjorski left behind a Yiddish language memoir, which takes his life up to 1913 when he moves to South Africa, and an unpublished English language memoir, which talks about his experiences in South Africa. Okay, with, with that there, Richard. I'm going to take over from that. Uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the formative years, the years in Eastern Europe. Uh, Bersky's published memoirs in Yiddish of his early life, which we had translated, is a wonderfully rich account of the making of a young Jewish Marxist in Tsarist Russia. Born in 1892 in Kovno, Kaunas in Lithuania, then part of the Pale of Settlement, his uh, early years before his departure for South Africa in 1913, coincided with momentous changes in the status of Jews in the Russian Empire. Long an oppressed minority, their position had dramatically deteriorated in the decade preceding Bierski's birth. The assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 precipitated widespread anti-Jewish rioting. These pogroms were followed by the May Laws of 1882, a set of harsh restrictions on Jewish life that radically expanded earlier discriminatory policies. These measures coincided the late 19th century with far-reaching demographic, social, and economic changes, resulting in the marginalization and immiseration of much of the Jewish population. In such stressful circumstances, the pogroms reinforced the sense of hopelessness and encouraged thoughts of immigration. What, it, uh, uh, what has previously been a trickle became a flood from the 1880s. Of the many remaining, some turned to radical solutions to the Jewish dilemma. In 1897, two key organizations were founded, which offered contrasting answers. The Zionist movement, which proposed Jewish self-determination in the Jewish homeland, and the General Jewish Labour Bund of, of Lithuania, Poland, and Russia, founded in Vilna by a small group of Marxist Jews, who believed that the fate of the Jewish working class, though distinctive, was bound up with the fate of their fellow oppressed workers, and that neither immigration nor Zionism provided solutions for the Jewish population of the Tsarist Empire. And as we will see, Bierski cast in his lot with Bundism and Zionism at opposite ends of his remarkable political odyssey. Uh, B Solomon Bierski came from a distinguished Lithuanian rabbinical lineage of which in later life he was immensely proud despite his early abandonment of traditional Jewish religious belief and a lifetime commitment to the secular faith of socialism. While his infant years were spent in the strictly orthodox home of his grandmother, where he was coached from an early age in the Jewish religious canon, he moved at the age of seven with his mother to join his father, Yankel, who worked as a manager of a chocolate factory in the expanding industrial center of Shavl, Shavli, in northern Lithuania. Unlike Solomon's grandmother, Solomon's parents developed a personalized and diluted version of orthodox Jewish practice, where while the Sabbath candles were lit on Friday night and the dietary laws of Kashrut were maintained, his father, convert to socialism, dined at a Gentile restaurant on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. For all of this provocative behavior, Yankel nonetheless insisted on certain observances, quote, so that his children would remain familiar with the Jewish tradition. Solomon spent a socialist childhood in Shavl. By his own account, he would play in the factory yard with the uh, young factory workers. He claimed in his memoirs that these were formative encounters but his later, quote, approach to various social questions arose from the factory yard psychology, unquote, he first experienced on the premises of his father's chocolate factory. The future communist had a further formative experience at the age of 10, when he discovered among his father's books, the Hebrew translation of Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards, 2000 to 1887, the best-selling and highly influential, influential utopian novel about a person falling asleep for a century and waking in a socialist paradise. This is what he wrote. This book made a massive impression on me. It opened my eyes once and for all, for all that was evil in our lives. And that was the cure. Precisely those ideas spelled the end of my father's 15 hour working days of the poverty and suffering all around us, to the crimes, murders, and robberies that I heard about every day. The impression that uh, it made upon me defies words. I almost lost my mind. I was so enchanted, weeks on end, I could speak about nothing but socialism. On the brink of the 1905 revolution, Bierski, who had barely entered adolescence, was, quote, already a revolutionary. The five or 10 copecks he received as pocket money from his father went on uh, brochures in Russian by Lenin, Plekhanov, Medem, and the like. The adolescent uh, Solomon was a precocious revolutionary. 
age 13 and a bar mitzvah boy, he applied in 1905 for membership of the Bunt in Shavu. That too young for formal membership, he was allowed to attend meetings and join his discussion. I'm going to cut my talk a little bit short. We are a little bit short of time. What I'm going to say here is that he receives a, a secular education in, a in addition to his traditional Jewish education. And because of uh, Zara's restrictions on Jewish higher education, he leaves for Berlin where he studies, um, uh, where he studies law. And in Berlin, he joins, he becomes more active in the uh, 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 Bund. He uh, is soon disillusioned with the Bund and already in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Berlin, he moves on and joins the, uh, the, the Bolsheviks, becomes a, uh, a, a, a Bolshevik. Um, he, uh, his education is cut uh, short, there's a family financial pressures and he returns home to Lithuania we marries a uh, we we marries against the wishes of his uh, uh, families because he's abandoned his studies. He loses his exemption from uh, military conscription, and in 1913 he receives uh, an order uh, for uh, for conscription. And uh, like many young Jewish males who are determined not to serve in an oppressive czarist uh, army, he decides to leave. He leaves. He leaves Russia. He leaves Lithuania illegally and in uh, 1913 makes his way uh, uh, to South Africa. I'll hand over at this point to Lucien to continue with his South African odyssey. So Solomon Bjorski was one of around 40,000 Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who made their way to South Africa from 1880 to 1914. He landed in Cape Town, which was a massively growing city. It had doubled in size. It had a Jewish population of about 8,000. But what we see in uh, Bjorski's life is, is a lot of, of moving around uh, politically as well as geographically. He arrives in a time in, in which there had been a massive general strike by white workers in 1913, very violent, followed by a second general strike in 1914 that was repressed, uh, a major strike by black workers on the mines in 1913, a big strike in the tower by Indians. 1914, there was also an armed rebellion by Afrikaner nationalists, the rates uh, a rebellion which actually split the army. So this was a time when unions were exploding in numbers um, from about 9,000 in 1914 to 40,000 in 1917 to 135,000 in 1920 and a massive strike wave. Now, initially Bjorski doesn't actually get involved in politics uh, fairly sensibly. He, he goes to a small Karoo town of Prince Albert to try to get a job. He works as a bookkeeper and he wants to bring his wife out, but the lure of politics is very important. Now, just as in uh, East Europe and the Russian empire, he had been engaged with uh, the Bund, uh, uh, Bolshevism. He had also been influenced by Bellamy, who was neither a Marxist nor, nor a Bundist. Um, here as well, he moves through a lot of different political spaces. And I, I think this is where I think it gives a sense of some of the complexity of left history and of the history of the party itself. So I'm going to focus on a few uh, highlights. The first thing is um, he joins a party called the SDF, the Social Democratic Federation in Cape Town. Now, despite its name, it's, it's a very broad party. It's got guild socialists, it's got Fabians, it's got Marxists, it's got anarchists. Uh, in fact, Wilfred Harrison, its main speaker, is the first guy to use the word communism in the South African press, but referring to anarchist communism. Gets frustrated. It's a very broad organization. It keeps splitting. It focuses on very abstract uh, politics. Um, this is, I think, a way that this broad organization keep, keep going, this very sort of general evangelization of, of left ideas. So he helped set up the Industrial Socialist League in 1918. This is not the same as the International Socialist League of Bill Andrews. The Industrial Socialist League has got, rather like the ICU in the 20s, has got a constitution based on that of the revolutionary syndicalist industrial workers of the world, the IWW. And it, it's quite explicit that its aim is to create one big union that will create uh, self-governing, I'm quoting, industries through a revolutionary strike. And although this is before the Communist Party, um, and the mythology of the Communist Party is in 24 that the left starts to focus on blacks and coloreds. Um, the Industrial Socialist League opens offices in District 6, 
Uh, police reports note it paid especial attention to the native and colored communities, as well as, quote, Russian Jews. It claimed to have colored and Malay comrades, was active in the Cape Federation of, of Labor, and also set up a trade union among black and colored workers on syndicalist lines. Um, from 1919 to 1920, in one year, we held 135 outdoor events, 32 lectures, six indoor events, and lots of other things. Now, in 1920, the Industrial Socialist League links up with people, dissidents in the International Socialist League, and sets up a communist party. This is not the CPSA. The communist party set up in October 1920 is the first communist party in Africa. It has, however, uh, what Lenin would call a ultra left platform. It's very similar to the people Lenin polemicized against in left wing communism and infantile disorder. And in fact, it's in direct contact with Sylvia Pankhurst Workers Socialist Federation. It circulates copies of the Workers Dreadnought. It hosts IWW sailors. Now, in 1921, this party, the SDF, the International Socialist League, a whole range of little groups, Pole Zion, which is Jewish Socialist Society, formed the early SACP. Now, if we look at the history of the early SACP or CPSA, just in terms of the big decisions of 24, 28, and 35, we miss a lot. Bjorski is not really involved in the big debates. Um, he's a trade unionist. He sets up a general workers' union. He organizes the unemployed. In 1925, he's a leading figure in a national communist-led campaign uh, to support a strike by British seamen who are doing a strike that spans Australia, South Africa, uh, New Zealand, and Britain. And he is very famous about this. He works around the clock. He gets lawyers. But Lucien, sorry, mm. can you yeah, um, work done. towards yeah. uh, wrapping up? Thanks. We are getting there. So there again, he's not involved in the big debates. Following this, he ends up in Lichtenberg. Henry mentioned um, the ICU strike there. Now, Lichtenberg, because it's quite cheap to mine, um, it's got a lot of poor whites. And although he's a bit alienated from the Communist Party, he joins the National Party, where he is uh, made leader of a branch, and he attends the 1927 NP Congress in the Transvaal, where he proposes a communist platform. Now, this is something, a Jewish communist in the National Party representing poor whites. Following this, in the 30s, we see him veer again. He goes to the Soviet Union on a tour, and he goes to the Jewish autonomous areas that are being created in the Ukraine. And this, this inspires him when he comes back to um, promote uh, more rapprochement between the Jewish Workers Club, which was a, a left-wing Communist Party linked group, and um, the more orthodox Zionists. And following that, he also engages with the Jewish Board of Deputies. In the 1940s, he's back in the party, very active, but he's, he's sort of increasingly cutting himself off. The National Party doesn't really want him. He doesn't really fit with what the Nats are after in the 30s. Um, the Zionists find him too left-wing. A lot of the Communist Party finds him too Zionist. Um, he's always his own thinker. He doesn't support the initial um, Stalin uh, Ribbentrop Pact. He doesn't really like the Native Republic. Um, and eventually, all of these worlds collapse. So he gets himself in this very isolated position with these very unorthodox positions that he takes. And through all this, he's trying to run small businesses, act as a bookkeeper, and this all crashes down after World War II, when his big contracts with the uh, military for uniforms go down. So having been labeled by some people as Zionist renegade and by others a, a dirty a Jewish communist, um, he decides to leave the country. Now, just to pull this together, I think we see here somebody thinking about the national question in a very different way to that we often assume the party does. Somebody who is a Jewish party member, but very, very different to those we know better, like Joe Slovo, Ray Alexander, somebody who's a founder member of the Communist Party, a supporter of Bunting, but a critic of the, the Native Republic who thinks we can actually work with Afrikaner nationalism. So this is part of what we're working on. Thanks very much for your time, and I will stop there. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Lucien. You uh, wrapped up very admirably over there. Um, just before we turn over to our next speaker, who's going to be uh, Peter Lim, who's sitting on my screen up in the top left-hand corner, but might be on your screen somewhere else. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, welcome uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at UJ, Prof Kamala Naidu, um, onto this webinar. Uh, I think she came on a bit after I'd started. Um, and to say that um, Kamala has uh, offered um, some excellent support to the organizers of this ongoing set of webinars. So thank you very much. Um, Peter is now going to be chatting to us. Uh, about, um, and I will give you his full title now, hundreds of native workers are joining the Communist Party in Bloemfontein. Which organization ever faced calamities, persecutions and prosecutions as the CP did? The Communists in the Free State 1921 to 1940. Uh, over to you, Peter. Thanks, Natasha. And there's some resonance with the first two uh, papers. Uh, scholars have failed to write more comprehensive histories of the CP and the Free State due to patchy records and general neglect that marginalizes Free State history. Eddie Rue, the Simonses, Johns and Drew show its meteoric rise and fall, yet we know less of personalities, structures, narratives. Bram Fisher is memorialized in Bloemfontein Airport, but wasn't active there. Drawn chiefly from police and press reports and lately some Jewish oral history, I add some meetings, members and metaphors largely missing from other works, including it seems Tom Lodge's new book. Movements from below explored by Bradford, Bundy and others and the white centered chronicles of local history that litter free state historiography remind us local history also should be history from below. Small towns too had crowds that flocked to rallies, middle strata from whence emerged activists who, as Charles Tilley observes, adapted available scripts and like troops of street musicians drew claim making performances from limited repertoires. There were scripts available and some of those have been mentioned by, by Henry and, and, uh, and Lucien. Uh, sometimes as you shall see, they wrote their own. The CP faced major problems, state and employer hostility, scant industrialization in the free state, regimented farms, an economy overwhelmingly rural, yet claims Helen Bradford with proletarianization furthest advanced. I think she means here uprooting rather than wage labor incorporation. Nevertheless, urbanization was underway, mine employment grew, uh, and there's some very interesting early black labor history on, on both in the North and the South uh, about strikes. I won't go into that now, uh, but by the CP's time it had withered. There were some railways, some engineering units, a few workers in textiles, but white unions rarely struck black workers more often, but invariably faced repression. Uh, as Hen Henry has mentioned, ICU, ANC interactions brought opportunities, but also problems. In Dan's words, and I'm sorry he can't be here today, only in the free state could communists claim limited success with the local ICU. But we, unions were weak, so too the black press uh, in the free state. Uh, the Chamber of Mines funded Umtateli always pushed hard to keep ICU activists away from it and dangled uh, uh, contracts uh, to, to give them a material interest in anti-communism. Uh, the ANC often exuded moderation, but had some radicals, for instance, in Bethlehem, in Winburg, in Mangong. Uh, in the Northeast, ICU figures articulated communistic ideas, yet there the party itself was absent. The raising the red flag by Dan refers to tiny uninfluential labor bodies of Bloemfontein. Still in May 1919, the ISL was cautiously optimistic of opening a branch. Police next month reported 10 active members. Uh, Victor Webb, a plumber, held a meeting in the location to form a huge labor organization. In 21, uh, a 1921 meeting in Smithfield to form a farmers co-op was surprised by one van der Poel, International World's Workers Organizing Secretary who secured 20 recruits. But as for the party itself, a free state rep sat on the first party executive in 21, possibly a Mrs. Burke under rule 5C for provincial reps. None were recorded at the fourth or 
third or fourth congresses, but the third received a telegram from the Bloemfontein Socialist Circle at the second delegate was noted. Sam Barlin, unattached EC member, organized in Joburg, but may also have worked in the Free State as in 24, he went to Bethlehem, dying there in 31. And Esther Stein was at the fifth. I'll come back to the Steins later on. In 23, locals felt it time to organize. Sam Malkinson penned, what's wrong with Bloemfontein? Nothing, he said, but then added, there's a good few socialists from the middle classes as well as class conscious workers, but a tendency to avoid, quote, any organized socialist movement, preferring a socialist circle. Simply, they were, he added, afraid. In a lighter vein, International carried a plaintive letter from a farm wanting to communicate with pen friend ladies on communism. In 24, the party critiqued anti-socialist Labour MLA for Bloemfontein, Arthur Barlow, who attacked, quote, the educated native who works on the side of revolution to oust the white man and filed reports on racist outrages that would have attracted support but the party's press circulation was limited. Nevertheless, a branch emerged, the work of the major figure of this decade, Malkinson. To John's, he was instrumental in building up the branch. Despite his obvious significance, his life is badly neglected. Like Bursky, he migrated from Lithuania in 14, worked on his uncle's farm in Tversprate, uh, been there, uh, but after seeing workers jambok, he ran away working in Joburg in an African eatery where he survived on a cup of coffee and a bun a day on a low wage, then to a Williamsrift butchery, then Cape Town as a bookkeeper. Uh, he was sacked because he was a Bolshevik. He went to Adderley Street meetings of anarchists, syndicalists, SDs and communists, choosing, choosing the latter as more logical. He met Harrison Bursky later on. When the CP joined, he uh, formed, he joined. He told Sylvia Neem, quote, I wasn't involved in unions. I was simply a Bolshevik. He wanted to join the 22 strikers because surely it was a strike against capitalism. But after an invitation from his brother stopped in Bloemfontein and took up accounting, he would give the party's annual financial report. He's unclear when exactly he started the branch. I began preaching in the location. I didn't expect whites to sympathize. There was only one in the branch. Isaiah and Taylor came in at the beginning, a good bloke. The ICU started coming later. They wanted to come to us. He also encouraged night schools. The other figure mentioned by Henry, but not in the party was Tabo Mote, whose attitude wobbled around. He briefly wrote for the South African worker, shared May Day platforms, but voted to expel communists, as Henry's noted. Eddie Rue argued the average black intellectual like him was willing enough to speak on our platform, but Rue saw his opportunism as a danger to the party. In 26, he had asked for more party literature after Cadelli gave him the ABC of communism, but the following year damned everything communist, rejecting claims by his occasional employer, Umtateli, who in 22 made him a Susutu sub-correspondent, and, and I've, I've delved quite deeply into the Sasutu columns of both Umtateli and Lese Dinyana, which is very interesting. And Modi's actually writing about history and agriculture before he joins the ICU. But he's doing it in Sasutu, so no one's ever taken any notice of it. So he denied the claim from Umtateli that he read, quote, nothing but communist literature. And now some of his comments at Lady Brandt, he claimed the whole population rose when told of the Russian Revolution. At Harry Smith, he trumpeted victory of socialism if we all unite under the worker flag and proclaim the dictatorship of the proletariat. At Rangerville, that Russia is the best governed country for workers. Yet he later recalled, we were bitter enemies of the communists. Overall, he articulated a gingered up ambiguous socialism. How to explain his twists and turns? Materially, he relied on payments from the union, 24 pounds, umtateli and Catholic school wages. Socially, as Bradford argues, he was certainly petty bourgeois. Ideologically, as Henry mentions, he blended Christianity and socialism and a few other things. 
And finally, he was pressured by state and ICU leaders to sever CP time, uh, ties. Government had him arrested and in 27, didn't consider him desirable to enter Lesotho, to enter Lesotho with speed, speeches tinged with communism. When he oscillated more to direct action, such as at Lichtenberg, which has been noticed, uh, AWD champion derided him as communistic and such den denunciations probably pushed him back to anti-communism. In by 29, he was marooned as secretary of his own mythical Bantu Socialist Party. Uh, by 31, he confirmed Ruth's critique by praising Herzog's good Christian government. An intriguing episode is Bunton's 29 visit to Mote. Uh, a spy reported Bunting sleeping in his house, telling him Mote was a good organizer, revolutionary enough. And uh, he'd invited him because many workers would like to meet him personally as an attorney, hear him speak on party political philosophy. Bunting was a good man, my friend. He helped with ICU cases even after communists were expelled. So internal ICU pressures contributed to his somersaults. Um, and in the written paper, some of this is coming out in a new book on the ICU. Uh, for one year, he was enamored with Cadelli's anti-communism, but in Heilbronn, he told a 600 strong meeting that socialism in our time is in common cause with the communists. Uh, Seppo Malloy shows that after being transferred uh, internally, he hit back by associating with the communists. Uh, so when back in 1923, he introduced the ICU to Lesseguignana readers as a product of mission education, he didn't fail to add that it got no help from Bolshevists. But in his red year, 26, he told an enthusiastic Frankfurt audience of 800, Abe Bailey and other whites drive nice cars while we die of hunger. Yet the star will trumpet I preach Bolshevism if I say Bailey has no right to all wealth. He then quoted biblical texts to prove Christ a communist. Helen Bradford sums him up. If not joining the party, he was considerably influenced by it ideologically. Robert Dumas blended Garveyism and rural utopian uh, communism. I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just uh, abbreviate some of his comments. In Christina Hamlet, he told a meeting, Russia is standing out as the communist. At Harris Smith, the Farms Association doesn't frighten me, but if they keep attacking us, we'll be turned communists. Um, he talked up Garvey, he talked about battles of Moshweshwi, and then suddenly he said, I'm speaking next week as a communist. We're coming in airplanes and we must destroy the capitalists. We want to establish the Black Republic. If the CP is against it, we'll kick it to hell too. In 1931, he even exposed farm evictions in Negro worker. Uh, down the road in Bethlehem, Paul Twyla took on moderates, declaring, I'm a communist and challenge you. The party press had other co far-flung correspondence in places such as rates, in Filion's thrift, um, and some of them had born there, moved away. Thomas and Becky was mentioned. There was E.T. Moffat Sinyana and Zula, who was arrested in Rueville in 29, Dan Clume, Morris and Pinky Richter, active in Kronstadt. So by 29, things, to be, things seem to be going quite well with the suggestion the next party Congress even be held in, be held in Bloemfontein. Edward Dambuza, uh, one of a new crop of militants trained by uh, Malkinson was joined by Esther Stein, either Esther with an A Stein of the Garment Workers Union or the actress Esther Stein with a TH, who was actually pictured in the fifth Congress as a member. And I'll come back to her again. So they, they were reported as accelerating the momentum as they dressed a large militant meeting in Batu Township. Now, it's, I've been doing some, some oral history and the dramatist Rose Ehrlich may have joined in Bloemfontein or Pretoria where she moved in 24. Her relatives think so. Uh, she was first secretary of the Bloemfontein Women's Enfranchisement League influenced by Olive uh, Schreiner. In 32, she chaired a, a talk by communist George Findlay to the Jewish club and visited the Soviet Union in 35, coming back to praise Soviet women's rights and widespread crashes. In 42, producing a Wolf Sax play for medical aid for Russia. Yet she holidayed with Colonel Cresswell. So uh, 
so to bring this uh, uh, together, CP meetings around the, the end of the decade took on a strident anti-imperialist hue. And Taylor mocked advisory board good bo advisory board good boys of imperialism. There was even a whiff of gunpowder in the air as both Emmanuel Tabe and Nzula uh, threatened to shoot back if Puro uh, used arms. Um, and, and, and here we see the, the quote that, that I've got in the title where uh, he, he, uh, Dambuza raged against do nothing leaders and repression, which organization ever faced calamities, persecution and prosecutions as the CP did. One he criticized besides Kadali as a coward was Sid uh, Mololi who had supported the league then backed out. At a rally, Sid replied, it's true, I am a coward, but Kadali didn't give me permission to attend the rally. <laughs> so curiously, Sid had been denied ICU membership for CP allegiance before the expulsions, which uh, Ceasing later told Sylvia Neem uh, meant that the, the expulsions didn't affect Bloemfontein although there had been strong expulsion to them in Batu and Bethany locations. So at this time, as, as we move to the 30s, and I won't go on to the 30s, and I'll bring this to a close uh, very soon, Umtateli claimed hundreds of workers were joining in Bloemfontein, one of the storm centers. We lack detailed records, but Nzula to the Comintern claimed 130 for, uh, for Bloemfontein around this time. And it's more or less uh, confirmed by police reports and the friend who, who confirm it was spreading among youth with public meetings every week and house to house visits. Sasutu articles saw alternatives to good boys in Taylor or Andrew Modibedi in Kroonstad, and they saw that their own paper as best to spread its word to the very friendly Bloemfontein. Now, Rue was paying two and six an issue for translations into Sasutu, but uh, here police reports confirm local authorship and demolish Mia Roth's ventriloquism th uh, thesis. It then all fell apart with bans, deportations, expulsions. Uh, ANC, ICU, anti-communism, Roe, Piro, Kadali, Mapikela all drove stakes into the CP's heart. Frustration with these checks, change of tack in Moscow proved disastrous. Walton accused Sam Malkinson of ultra-leftism. He had lambasted the old ANC, deriding Mahabane as the future ruling Pope Yet he was amiable with him and spoke at successive ANC conferences, even to some applause, and he was still party bookkeeper. Book, bookkeeper. As for Taylor, uh, Ikaka legal aid couldn't stop his deportation to Lesotho. Uh, but when this happened, the location women at both uh, communist and ANC women's meeting uh, had a swift response. They wanted the Bishop, Bishop Carey deported instead. He had attacked African morals and drunkenness at the ANC uh, uh, chiefs conference. And so the women really got stuck into him. As for Malkinson was then expelled and Dan Johns notes that this resulted in the dis disintegration of the lone organized section in the province. Walton was my executioner, Sam recalled. And after 31, there's little evidence of a branch. A 39 reports suggests only individuals, but there are glimpses of activity. African communist Philip Thompson reported struggles in Rueville where he was deported. He came from Rueville, from Durban where he'd been working with Johannes and Cozy. Moffat Sinyana urged uh, ANC CP unity at a 34 Mangaung protest by 3000 women with Tabe still active. And JJ Salipi reported a teacher's strike in a Witsishook mission school that was rechristened by locals, the Soviet Union School Kwakwa. As for Malkinson, and I'll end uh, here, Malkinson went to Europe in 32 meeting Esther Stein, that's Esther with a TH, a Jewish actress who offered contacts with Comintern appeals. The presence of her in Ehrlich in the story suggests a need to go beyond what little we know of party culture. I mean, there's a bit about Eddie Rue's uh, uh, Lino Cup cartoons, but not a lot more. What about possible Brechtian or even George Bernard Shaw influence because they played in both. Sam in Germany and Lithuania experienced fascist rule on return. He never rejoined but kept in touch with the CP. He wrote the Africana profile, it's in SOAS, which Governor Becky, Governor Becky thought had dynamite in it, seized by special branch which harassed him. He suffered from insomnia and they kept him awake. 
Dennis Goldberg told me he knew Sam who lived in the township simply as a Stalinist. Yet he was the first to suffer, to suffer Stalin's policies in South Africa. He disliked labels, rejecting Rue's characterization as a buntingite and he worked to combat racism and Cold War stereotypes of Russians. With and Taylor, who disappears from view, and others, he helped start a lineage of socialism. To conclude, the Free State CP rapidly gained support in the late 20s, just as quickly fading. It remained a micro party, if of a new kind, with a black majority, and its path that it laid down did not entirely, entirely disappear. Networks of migrancy and party press distribution persisted and adherents kept alive techniques and ideas, if not branches. Support for Moffat Sinyana and Basner in 35 from ICU veterans, a revival of a spirit of revolt in Vitsi's hook, speak to the sparking of a quasi revolutionary political consciousness that would smolder on. Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks, Peter. That was great. And um, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, throwaway comment to Mia Roth, um, or not so throwaway in your paper, which brings us into uh, Bob's um, presentation. I'm just going to read your title now, uh, Bob. So uh, uh, Bob Edgar will be speaking on Josie and Pama and the Communist Party of South Africa, 1930 to 1948. So also taking us a bit into a more recent um, uh, a more recent period of history, which is only something a historian can say, because I think there are many, many people here who wouldn't understand the 1940s as being more recent. OK, Bob, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Um, well, I'm delighted to be with you this, this afternoon, uh, South Africa time. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to participate on this panel and, and to see uh, uh, people like Peter and uh, Richard and, uh, and getting to know Henry, who I've had a lot of exchanges with. So uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Uh, my topic is about Josie and Palma. Uh, and I'm going to do a bit of self-promotion here. Uh, this is a new book that uh, I published last year, a biography of Josie and Palma, published by Ohio University Press. Uh, Jakana Press in South Africa has um, agreed to do a South African edition. I hope it is on sale now, uh, but I, of course, encourage everyone to, to pick up a copy. Um, let me start. Uh, Noam Beniso Gaza uh, about uh, Josie, uh, because I think it accurately captures some of what she was about. And she calls Josie, quote, an untidy hero for those who want to present a one sided view of history. She demonstrated a fierce sense of power and of organizing women independently. So let me briefly talk about uh, Josie's background and then talk about uh, specific issues, in particular, uh, the issue of uh, organizing uh, on racial lines, and secondly, uh, her involvement in gendered politics. Um, Josie was born in 1903 in Pochestrum. Uh, her father was a court interpreter. Um, uh, he was in that sort of elite group with Saul Pleike and so forth. Uh, his mother, uh, he was a Zulu, uh, Stephen Mpamu. His uh, wife, uh, Josie's mother, was uh, somebody with a, a very fascinating mixed race uh, background. Uh, they divorced uh, when Josie was quite young. And as a result of that, uh, Josie was shuttered around uh, uh, between various family members uh, for the next, well, through her teens. And uh, if one reads the, uh, her autobiography, which she composed when she was in Moscow in 1935, one gets the sense of her being, uh, having a very 
unhappy childhood, a very difficult, uh, stressful childhood. Um, she takes up uh, many jobs as a teenager to help support her mother. Um, she's a domestic, uh, domestic worker. Uh, she's a seamstress. Uh, she's also uh, a laundress. And these are things that uh, come to the fore later on in her life. In the late 1920s, she becomes involved in political activism in Pochestru. Uh, there are a number of issues uh, that come to the fore then, but the primary one is a lodger's fee that the white uh, municipality imposes on black residents. And it forces people to charge rents uh, to their older uh, children, people in their late tweens and teens and older. And of course, it creates enormous burdens. Uh, but one of the issues that comes out of that is that uh, because of her upbringing and the, the issues that she faced as a child, she's very much concerned about uh, family issues and community issues. And these are issues that she's going to take up uh, throughout her uh, political life. Uh, the Communist Party, of course, becomes involved in the Potterstrom protests. Uh, Josie joins the party. Her uh, husband uh, uh, that she marries in the late 1920s is Tabo Mufutsanyana. Uh, and uh, the party enrolls several thousand people, but as both she and uh, Mufutsanyana explain, uh, people who joined the party uh, were not people who joined because of ideological uh, understanding. It was because the party was a party of action uh, and they had lawyers that they could bring to court cases successfully in the case of Poacher's Trim. Now, in terms of their organizing, uh, one of the issues that, that came up, and I'm moving to a, 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 a quote here, one of the issues that came up was how do they organize across racial lines? In other words, how can blacks and whites uh, join together in political protests? And the difficulty in, in Poetry Stream was that you had a number of low income whites who actually uh, engaged socially with, with black people in the, in the location, but how do you appeal to them politically? And here's a quote from Josie about her experience in Pochestrum. Quote, unity can be achieved between white and black, but what is necessary here is that we first must organize the whites to such a stage where they will see what the cause of their poverty is, how they are to struggle against it. Then we should pick from the crowd those more conscious, have a private talk with them so as to test their feelings. When we find that we have a few who understand, then we can begin to put in, we, we can begin to put to poor whites the native question. Now this issue of organizing across racial lines uh, also comes up when Josie goes to Moscow for party training in 1935. She's going to spend a year there. Now keep in mind that the 1930s were a tumultuous period for the Communist Party. It virtually uh, became moribund during that period because of internal ideological disputes. Well, in Moscow, she appears before the Marty Commission, which uh, is a common turn commission set up to try to hear the different factions, the two major factions in the Communist Party. And, um, and to try to come up with a uh, a, a resolution to their disputes. But she appears before the Marty Commission, and this was in the context of the uh, Seventh Common Turn International Congress, which was putting forward a line of creating, forging an anti-imperialist an anti front. In other words, one had to sort of uh, reach out across uh, the political divide and organize whites and blacks uh, together. And here is the concern that she expresses in her testimony to the, uh, to the Marty Commission. Uh, 
And she said, if whites were, quote, politically educated, there might be a possibility of a united front with whites, but only if we knew what line to take. We were working blindly, and instead of making use of the white people, we drove them away. We did not allow any white man to come near our meetings. Here is one thing we must take into consideration. There is no getting away from it. The white man may be very poor, but he will be below the grade of the native. But he is anti-native. And the same thing is with the natives. They look upon the whites as exploit exploiters. They cannot understand that there can be such white men who can come out in sympathy with the native workers. For the mere reason that his skin is white, he is looked upon as an exploiter of the native people. Now this issue of the difficulty of organizing uh, blacks and whites together also comes up in late 1937 because there are sort of racial tensions developing within the communist party itself. Uh, in late 1937, the gen then general secretary of the party, Tabo Mufutsunyana, puts forward a resolution to the National Convention in December, late December 1937. And it's basically to split the party into two wings, one a, an African wing, the other a, a white wing, uh, wing. And it creates, an, of course, an enormous debate about what the, uh, the party is about. Uh, the, practical, uh, the practical issue that Mufutsunyana and others in the party, including Moses Katani and so forth, were raising was um, how can we organize blacks and whites? Because during the day we might cooperate and get along well uh, in the party office. But in the evening, we go our separate ways. Uh, white uh, communists do not come out to the locations to organize. They don't speak African languages. Uh, and so on a practical level, what we have right now in late 1937 is a white party and an African party. And here is Josie speaking on that particular issue. Uh, and she says, White members did not have firsthand knowledge of how Blacks lived or what the party was doing in the locations. And she said, quote, how can they speak about these matters? Comrades, comrades, meaning white comrades, must come among the masses. And she further observed that when whites and African members uh, met together, Africans were reluctant to join in discussions, but she went on, quote, when Europeans are comrades are absent, the natives discuss. Uh, and she further recommended that the white party members not be involved in organizing in the African locations. Now, there was pushback on this resolution. Nani recognized uh, the fact that uh, the party uh, did have on a practical level, white and African uh, wings, he argued that the party stood for something. In other words, it stood for reaching across racial lines. And so he could not support uh, these separate wings. When I interviewed Tabo Mufutsunyana in the early 1980s in Lesotho, uh, as he looked back upon that resolution, he said, you know, as I look back on it, um, I, I think I was uh, reflecting what the reality was, but he was glad that the resolution was defeated. And that was a very important uh, moment for the, uh, the Communist Party in terms of its uh, way forward. Uh, now, by the late 1930s, uh, the party really was in a dire uh, uh, situation. Uh, now, during the 1930s, uh, Josie and Palma also begins to speak out about uh, gender issues uh, more broadly, not just the Communist Party, but gender issues more broadly. And she especially targeted African men for uh, 
preventing black women from participating politically uh, in uh, national organizations. Uh, in particular, she said, African men uh, uh, might invite uh, uh, the women on social occasions uh, occasionally, but by and large, they wanted the women to be in the kitchens. And that's going to be an issue uh, of women being in the domestic spheres uh, that's going to carry on in terms of Josie's uh, take on, on issues. In the mid 1930s, uh, she becomes involved through the Communist Party in the All African Convention in the African National Congress. I thought it was fascinating that she observed that one of the major issues in 1936 was over the Herzog Bill that was getting rid of the uh, African vote, which was, of course, a male African vote. And she raised the question Will women? energetically uh, help to organize to try to preserve the, uh, the male African vote in the Cape when they really don't have a personal interest in it. In other words, uh, African, uh, these African male voters are not interested in expanding the franchise to black women as well. Uh, in the late 1930s then, the tenor of Josie's involvement is that she wants uh, African women to work, despite her misgivings, cooperatively with uh, African men. But by the late 1930s, she, she begins to shift her stance. And she decides to begin promoting her involvement in uh, African women's organizations, organizing on their own. And what is the tenor or what is the thrust of what she is, is arguing? Well, she believes that African women can best be organized, best be mobilized and inspired by dealing with practical gender issues. In other words, the kind of family and community issues that she was uh, interested in in Potterstrom in the late 1920s. What are some of these issues? Beer brewing, pass laws, housing evictions, high rents, healthcare, education. And these were all issues that she is taking up in the late 1930s uh, throughout the 1940s. It's interesting in the 1950s, she becomes one of the founding members of the Federation of South African Women. And her position at that point begins to shift again in terms of organizing across gender lines. Now, to just very briefly to sum up things, I'll go back to the quote from Nobuniso Gaza. Josie was a very independent minded person. She spoke out forcefully, and I've only given you a, a bit of a flavor of her, her thinking, but she spoke out forcefully on a number of issues. And so, as we begin to assess the Communist Party, especially during this period, uh, Looking at individual lives, I think, gives us a great deal of insight into how the party was operating on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. Um, that was excellent and um, good to know um, uh, a bit more about Josie. Um, for those of you who missed it, I posted a link to the Jakarta volume in the chat. Um, so what's going to happen now is uh, John Hislop, who uh, is formerly of WITS, uh, currently at Colgate University in the US, is going to um, give us some comments on the various presentations. And then we'll be opening questions up to the floor. When you do have questions, please will you address them um, in the chat first? So it gives us, or it gives me um, a way to uh, put questions in order. Um, we'll take a couple of questions um, at a time and then um, throw them out um, for people to answer. Um, so for the moment, over to John. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, it's really great to be here and to be commenting on these wonderful rich papers. Um, Lucien very well articulated uh, the 
problems of the specifically South African historiography of communism. And I think these papers show how uh, a much more fine grained and uh, detailed uh, kind of analysis of individual biographies and uh, local situations uh, can help us to understand things in, 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 in a rather a different way. Um, I, I think though, uh, what I've decided to do as I wasn't able to, to, to read the papers before is um, rather than to ask detailed questions, I'm going to just speak about four general issues about this historiography um, and then the um, speakers can re respond or not as, as they like, but I, I'm, I'm hoping I, I can assist in, in framing the debate a bit. Um, if you look at the historiography of communism globally, um, one way to, to think about it is that it tends to divide into two groups. You get firstly a generally um, sympathetic literature on individual national communist parties, uh, which stresses their role in uh, local and national struggles, um, how they're part of the, the, the organic um, history of the labor movement and popular movements in their society. And then on the other hand, you get a generally hostile literature, both from conservatives and from anti-communist leftists, which uh, portrays communist parties as instruments of the Soviet Union um, and essentially totally cynical organizations. Um, and in a, a, a sense, the, the, the problem is, of course, that there are elements of truth in both of us, right? In, in most countries where communists were active, they did play an extraordinary role in the labor movement and in uh, movements for social justice, um, but they also were manipulated by the, uh, by the Soviet Union and by, by Stalinism. Um, but I think the papers suggest uh, also another layer of complexity to, to, to this picture, which has been um, you know, pointed to by various um, historians in the field, which is that firstly, uh, so, uh, there is a uh, complex way in which communist ideologies were influenced by other uh, political uh, strands, strands, uh, strands of thought. Uh, and uh, this comes out really well, I think, in Henry's work, um, where we see through the ICU the, the influence of Garveyism. And I, I think that question of Garveyism is so important because I'm increasingly picking up, I think, that Garveyism was not only important in the 20s, but really persisted into the 30s. So if you look at, for example, the boycott of sh uh, shipping by dock workers in South Africa and Namibia, um, going uh, to support the uh, Italian war in um, the Horn of Africa, um, it seems to me that they're both communist and Garveyite strands in that. So I, I think that Gar communist Garveyite interaction uh, operates much later than we think. I also think that it's important to look at, if you like, lateral connections inside communism, which are not, if you like, South Africa, Moscow interactions, uh, but go elsewhere. And one of the rather fascinating things about uh, the way the Comintern operated was that it kind of devolved some of the management of um, communist parties in British Empire countries um, to the Communist Party of Great Britain. So there's a rather fascinating interaction there. And, and for example, when Harry Pollitt, the leader of the British Communist Party, gets deposed for not going along with the uh, Nazi Soviet pact, um, there's evidence that quite a number of people in South Africa actually saw that whole issue through what's happening around, uh, around Pollitt. Um, there's also a question, for example, of the um, League Against Imperialism uh, run by Willy Munzenberg out of Berlin, late 1920s and, and 30s, um, which clearly has some interesting 
connections with South African communism, which have not really been explored. For example, J.T. Gamedi actually goes to the League Against Imperialism conference. And when he arrives in the station in Berlin, there's a sort of mass gathering of German Red Guards to greet him. So this, these kinds of lateral communist histories, I think, need to be explored. I think, secondly, there is the whole question of Stalinism. And I think there's a bit of a tendency to say, well, of course, people joined the Communist Party, not because they were interested in international politics, but because, um, the, the, because of, of the struggle which is in front of them, which obviously is generally true. But communists were massively interested in global politics. Um, and it's not as if they were not aware of the issues of the rise of Stalinism. I mean, they all went to Fanny Clement, all the people in Joburg, I suppose the more intellectual section of the party, went to Fanny Kleneman's Trotskyist bookshop in Johannesburg, which was full of stuff about critiques of Stalinism, uh, et cetera. And of course they were experiencing some of the con uh, 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 consequences of Stalinism with, for example, the mysterious disappearance of their comrade Lazar Bach, um, the disastrous policies which were imposed on them in the thirties and so forth. Third point I wanted to make was that I think this period of the um, First World War and its aftermath is, is worth rethinking. Um, you know, I, I think that the First World War has not perhaps been given the centrality in South African historiography, which I would actually want to give it. And I think we need to think about the First World War in a rather different way. There's a very interesting argument by Robert Gerwarth and Eris Manella, which is that the First World War is not 1914 to 1918, but 1911-12, the Balkan Wars and Italian invasion of Libya, uh, to 1923, end of the Russian Civil War, and um, stabilization of uh, the, the crisis in Turkey. Um, now, what's interesting about that, I think, is that it offers, it fits quite well uh, uh, to South Africa because it's also the period when in the labor movement, syndicalism is really, really powerful. And I think 1924 really is a kind of underestimated point in South African history because up to 1924, uh, 20, uh, working, white working class is still really unintegrated. And, and 1924, I think, is really the beginning of the integration of the white working class into uh, the, uh, the, 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 the state. Um, and I think that has important consequences for how the uh, communists then act and why there's that sort of break of the, the from uh, focusing on the white working class to focusing on, on the black working class. I think that's, the, that is a crucial moment. Last point I want to make is I want to raise the question of um, anti-fascism, which I've become very preoccupied with recently. Um, the, one historian has said that anti-fascism is the most successful ideology of the 20th century. People could necessar couldn't necessarily agree what they were for, but they could agree what they were against. And, um, and but anti-fascism, of course, in a colonial situation was actually quite problematic because um, in, if your main global priority is to make alliances with the um, liberal um, upper classes and middle classes in Europe, it rather goes against the grain of an anti-colonial project. And I think there's no doubt there was a kind of dialing back of anti-colonialism, which in, in the common term, which was very problematic, I think, for uh, people fighting um, anti-colonial uh, um, struggles. But one of the th things which is really striking about the Communist Party is actually one of its great successes in this era was the Springbok Legion in the wartime, which is essentially drawing in uh, whites to a sort of mm, murkily progressive project, but which rather founders on the fact that although white soldiers are prepared to go for social progress, they're not necessarily prepared to go for deracialization. Um, but Popular frontism amongst whites was even, even when the Communist Party was really at its sort of nadir in the 30s, quite successful. I mean, I've come across a lot of evidence of 
uh, white interest in supporting the Republicans in the um, Spanish Civil War and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, and in a way, I think this goes to a point that uh, Robert was making, that in a certain way, what you see in the 30s and 40s is, if you like, separate white and black communisms, and that in some sense, that separation, I'd suggest, is underpinned by the way that there's a differential reaction to uh, the idea of anti-fascism. Uh, so those are some thoughts which um, hopefully will um, uh, uh, provide something for people to comment on. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Um, that, that was most excellent. And um, just as an aside, I agree entirely with you about your point about uh, the Great War uh, and the extent to which it's underappreciated. And that's not even before we get into uh, the history of the Communist Party. Uh, I have um, uh, a couple of questions um, up ahead. I'm going to leave your comments um, with the presenters for them to think about for a bit. Um, and so far, I have queued for questions. Um, uh, uh, Paul Landau, and this is when I have to flip between screens, Liz Gunner. Um, so, Paul and Liz, will you ask your questions um, uh, as real live people, if you wouldn't mind? Um, and then after we've had those two questions, if there's not a third one, we'll go back to the presenters so that they can address these issues. Thanks. Thank you very much, Natasha. And unfortunately, I still may be distracted imminently by two dogs. I apologize for that. Um, this was fascinating, and as somebody who has done a different kind of research in rural uh, South African history, I just learned a tremendous amount. Um, and uh, especially, I think, uh, if I can say so for me, Henry's paper, but also uh, uh, Lucian's uh, remarks. So if I make a criticism, it's in the spirit of having learned a great deal. And it's a sort of suggestive uh, criticism. I find that there's increasingly little related to the existing rural political tradition in organizing. I think maybe this is less true for Bob's work, but that this, this isn't a, a blank slate on which uh, Garveyite ideas are written. Um, and I'm, I'm a little worried that this is a trend in general for scholarship, that we sort of now are focusing more on, on things within comfort zones. And I know that there are language barriers and so on, but I think that the issue is that black mass organization arrives in many ways in the 1920s. And what you guys are talking about is one specific aspect of it. And it arrives just as traditional and neo-traditional modes of amalgamative organization are being eclipsed in the countryside in the 1910s and 20s and among peasants in the Free State and the, and the Cape. And I think that's my most significant feeling is that we need to somehow link and articulate seriously now with rural forms of organization and get out of this mindset that it's all sort of retroactively contaminated by uh, homeland uh, policy. So if I could say, lastly, I think there are other cultural elements of association competing for people's time. If you think about workers, and I wanna ask whether people have thought about things, stop it, in this way, that there are uh, soccer associations, uh, sport, uh, for youth, there are uh, school associations of various kinds. There are, of course, uh, churches and independent churches operating. And these are social forms of public action that are competing at one time for people. And I just want to bring that into the issue and ask people generally to comment. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Liz, will you ask your question? And then there's also a question by um, Philip Yalungu, and I did see um, your, um, uh, uh, your, your 
uh, responds, Peter. I'll come back to it in a moment. Thanks very much. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, yeah, the question I wanted to ask is um, about <clears throat> Kada Kadali as as a Malawian, and um, no one hardly ever mentions the fact that he was a Malawian. But <clears throat> was there, in fact, a more regional activist movement uh, which had migrants in it, um, but the, the migrant presence is actually never recognised? because it falls outside the national paradigms of debate. So people don't know what to do with it. Um, I noticed that um, when, when Henry spoke, he said in passing that one of um, Kadali's interest was in fact um, migrant, migrant activism. And I just wondered if you know what happens if we look at all this in this wonderful activism, which you've all been talking about so eloquently, if you put it onto, um, a, a southern regional template rather than a South African and a global one. Um, does it shift at all? Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, um, uh, Philip Nyalungu, you had a, a question from earlier that was, I think, specifically for Henry, but do you want to ask, uh, articulate it, or shall Henry just um, reply to the question in the chat? Uh, I think Henry can just, uh, yeah. Well, uh, it's also from my recent uh, encounter. Um, I'm uh, interviewing um, refugees in the refugee camp and then individually. And then um, I was uh, shocked when I interviewed uh, one, uh, this guy. He worked for more than nine years. And then again, he worked for another five years. And then in, um, in both incidents, he was, registered and then when I asked him about um, uh, uh, whether uh, there was a union, he said yes, there was a union, but this union when they come, they will um, literally uh, ignore them because they are immigrants, they're not South Africans, and then like literally, and then I find uh, that really disturbing. And then um, and then every time when this thing is discussed, that so is that a ANC government is very bad and even among refugees it's all ANC government as if it was another government things would have been better and then now um that um uh uh henry what's his name uh, he just raised it so i'm starting to think oh this thing comes from a very long time it's not something which started today so i think it's important oh, how to have that with, thing because I think, uh, I mean, it's a confusion to only think it's, the a, it's only happening in the ANC. I mean, I think maybe if we start to have links on also how uh, this uh, uh, xenophobia is coming from, because I'm starting to think it's, it's start to start uh, with the ANC. I think it was a very long time ago. But okay, um, yeah, the question uh, on this, uh, 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 how uh, workers are being treated by the trade union uh, if they're not from uh, South Africa, yeah. Did you hear me? Uh, 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 yeah. Did you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, <clears throat> thanks. We've got a, a couple of questions lined up, and we've also got uh, the comments that uh, uh, John made. Um, Russell, I can see your hands up, but I'm going to let the, res the, the, partic the participants respond, and then I'll take your question and any others that come up. So shall we um, respond in reverse order of presentation, um, which would be, um, first of all, Bob, if you've got anything to say, um, and then Peter, and then um, Lucien and Richard, and then um, Henry. All right. Are you, are you saying I should go ahead? Yes, okay, good. You can hear me though, good, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, the one very quick comment. Uh, I appreciate what Paul Landau is, uh, is raising uh, uh, about the relatively, relative neglect of rural areas when we talk about, uh, uh, talk about the party. Although there's a fair amount of, 
of uh, evidence uh, that, that it is out there. But uh, having written uh, extensively on independent churches and, and especially uh, prophet mo prophetic movements in the Eastern Cape, I, I'm very sensitive to this issue about uh, stressing uh, what is going on in the rural areas and how that uh, uh, has an impact on national uh, political movements. And I know uh, Paul has also written substantially on, on this issue. So I, uh, I agree with the, the point that he's raising. Peter? Yes, I'd also like to take up that point from Paul. And um, I do look at rural communism, and there's an interesting literature, for instance, from France on rural communism, Sewell and others, and also in Vietnam. But uh, I did mention a whole range of rural dorps and dorpies. And I noticed that Chicha Twile has just joined us, and he's originally from Harris Smith. So in that whole area, a triangle, if you like, Harris Smith, Maymol, uh, the little tiny uh, hamlet of Christina up to Freda. There's some very interesting police reports on communistic speeches by people like uh, Robert Duma, who ends up writing for the Negro worker, as I said. Now, the reports of these constables and sergeants sometimes say, well, the majority of the crowd actually agreed with Duma on this. And it's quite interesting. Uh, they might have, you can read critically police reports in different ways. And I even went to a conference on police uh, archives once. It's quite a fascinating thing. And way back, Bob managed to get these microfilms from the Department of Justice out. But what the police are, are also counting heads, more or less. And in some of the meetings, they say there was sort of a majority of rural laborers that had ridden in. And there's a whole literature in the free state from the 20s, not just around the ICU, but even earlier, Kus, uh, Matang and others of laborers and sharecroppers riding in to these meetings. The problem for the party, I think, is that how do you have a party office? How do you just, they could send the newspaper out, Umsa Benzi could be sent out, but it was very difficult in segregated uh, townships. And I've been into some of those segregated townships like in Harris, Smith and Hobb House, all, num all number of them. The facilities available to have a party office were very limited there, as opposed to Kroonstadt and Bloemfontein. So that's the thing that I'd add in there. The other quick thing, the Witz Oral History Archive, which is very rich on political peasants, if I can put it that way, talks about many of them not joining, some of them joining the ICU, some of them going to football matches to see meetings, but the interviewers in the 1970s and 80s never once asked about the Communist Party. So. Thanks, Peter. Um, Lucien and Richard. Lucien, your mic's off. Okay, cool. Um, I'll be answering for both of us. I hope Richard uh, is happy with what I, I answer. Um, yeah, th there's quite a lot of points that were raised and um, I, I thought there's one or two ways I, I could summarize them a bit and respond from our paper. I think Liz Gunner's point about the need to think regionally, mm. we, we often project uh, the South African state as it is as a self-evident unit of politics. Um, but actually for the early communist party, a, a lot of their focus wasn't actually South Africa, it was British imperialism. So even when the communist party moves to the theory of colonialism of a special type, that's actually part of a shift in thinking towards a national framing of the South African struggle, which was not necessarily there earlier. Um, the ICU and Richard, uh, uh, I'm sure Henry can speak to this more in fact, didn't, didn't explicitly uh, reduce itself to South Africa. I've, I've written on the ICU in Southwest Africa, and the branch in Luderitz was not considered the Southwest African branch. It was just another branch, like the branches in Worcester, in, in the Eastern Cape, in the Western Cape, or Port Elizabeth. So this national imagining itself needs to be historicized and uh, relativized. Even white trade unions, uh, the bank union, SASBO, was in 
uh, Namibia, it was in uh, what's Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, as well as South Africa. So that's important. Uh, the other thing, um, John raised the issue of Stalinism, and I want to suggest a different approach to that, which is to think about um, Stalinism beyond Stalinism as a political culture, but Stalinism as a form of national Bolshevism. I don't mean um, a Bolshevism of some sort of nationalist deviation, but Stalinism really strongly stressed in the Stalin period the importance of um, the Soviet Union as a collection of nationalities, and those nationalities that were not full nations would have autonomous zones within the Soviet Union. So for Yiddish-speaking Jews, there were several efforts at that for uh, Cossacks and for others. And this was quite an important feature of that Stalinist language, which was still being picked up in the 50s in the Communist Party by people like Lionel Foreman, who has got a, had an incredibly interesting take on South Africa. So when Bjorski was coming from the Bund, which argued that they were Marxists, but they argued for Jewish autonomy, and then later is going to the Soviet Union to look at a Jewish autonomous zone, and then is arguing for Jewish national home in Palestine, it's not something completely outside of the left. There is a thinking around nations and nationalities as one requiring territory. That's part of Stalin's definition of a nation. It's psychology, culture, history, economy, and territory, which was very influential for people. And it's it's something which John spoke about these these overlinks uh, overlaps. I, I wouldn't know what the lineage of it was, but certainly Bundism and elements of uh, Marxism, Leninism in the thirties had had some similarities, uh, which we forget. All right, now that brings me to the last point, which is that I think really the point of somebody like. Um, Bjorski is he doesn't fit into a neat story. Bob Edgar was speaking about uh, Josie uh, Palmer uh, or Josie and Palmer as, as, as a messy hero that doesn't fit. I, I think if we look at um, Bjorski, either as somebody who was looking for a range of political spaces, not necessarily the obvious ones, and certainly not the ones that looking at the party from the present would suggest, e.g. the ANC, um, is very interesting. Working in the National Party, working in a strike with British sailors, not South African sailors, British sailors, uh, being involved in the Jewish Workers Club and getting them to work with Zionists, joining the Jewish Board of Deputies, it's interesting and it doesn't fit. Two, I think his approach on the national question, although not consistent, uh, alerts us to the need not to be too simplistic. There was a time when the Communist Party did not prioritize the ANC. It seems now that once you have the Native Republic, you had to end up with the ANC, but that only happens in the 50s. Um, there, there was a long history and a long debate in the Communist Party about the National Party and republicanism. Bjorski in his memoir said, I remained convinced that an anti-capitalist Republican Party based among poor Afrikaners would be very popular. So to bring all that together, um, there's a huge amount of richness, and uh, I just really want to say it's been wonderful being on such a great panel. I mean, these papers are just Fantastic. Very, very good. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. Thanks. Um, and then, <clears throat> sorry, um, why don't we have a response from Henry? Um, I know who has, I think, quite a lot of ideas um, uh, in relation to the comments that have gone down so far. Thanks, Natasha. Um, thanks, yeah, for some really great questions and comments. Um, I'll just touch on a few. Um, Paul's question about rural organizing. Um, I think, yeah, like the work of like Helen Bradford and JT Campbell are like, I haven't really sort of, but yeah, I think that's still the, the best scholarship that is out there. And I think, yes, yeah, you, you're correct to be wary that these organizations aren't sort of like, well, the people that are being organized aren't blank states before, before they're organized. Um, I suppose what is different in the 1920s if, is if you map out the spread of the ICU, initially they travel along railway lines uh, for the first uh, six years, but then in the latter half of the 1920s, um, they then spread out from the main urban centres and they get switch from using trains as their main mode of transport to cars uh, through a uh, higher purchase a number of cars and I suppose that's an interesting way of thinking about like, well, how um, actually new forms of mass organization are possible is, is through like new, new technologies, such as the car, which is being introduced. Um, um, and in terms of 
yeah, like cultural elements. I mean, certainly by the ni early 1930s, um, the ICU in East London is organising, uh, has a rugby team throughout the 30s and early 40s, um, alongside its sort of meetings which take place on a Sunday, which I think in many ways is sort of like in conflict with uh, established church organisations. Um, in terms of Kadali's identity as a Malawian, I mean, interest, one of the exciting things that came up as part of my research was the number of other Malawian leaders, uh, part like uh, which Lucian's also talked about. So Kadali was the first secretary, actually the first assistant secretary was another of the ICU was another Malawian, Peter Nyambo, who was involved with the Cape Town ANC and Ethiopian church networks in Cape Town. And then a number of Malawians then spread the ICU to uh, Zimbabwe Zam, uh, and, and Malawi and sort of tentative attempts within Mozambique. Um, yeah, and as Lucian said, like the ICU operates on this regional scale. Um, and in many ways it has like these big ambitions. So it even like attempts to organize Mozambican workers, although that's a bit of a failure and the ICU collapses before it is able to effectively organize them. But it, by the end of the twenties, they are sort of beginning to make contact with some Mozambican radicals. I suppose where then it's interesting with the Communist Party is that then the Communist Party adapts this Black Republic thesis, maybe in, in a more South African centric, with a South African centric focus, whereas the ICU maybe in many ways is explicitly transnational from, from the start. Um, one interesting thing working in the National Archives of Malawi was that in 1932, the Communist Party of South Africa tries to, or puts out feelers to establish a Communist Party of Nyasaland in 1932 and contacts Kadali's relatives in the north of Malawi. Uh, then finally, in Philip Nyalangu's question about early discrimination by trade unions, I mean, that was another interesting thing. Like a lot of the ICU's transnational leadership is then criticized by some figures with the, within the ANC on a sort of like South African nationalist basis. So um, Henry Selby Imsaman calls for the deportation of all Malawians at the end of the 1920s and sort of, yeah, does does organize trade unions, but in an, an a sort of um, exclusive xenophobic way. And I suppose that part, partly over the course of the 1920s, you have this sort of like emergence of a more exclusionary South African nationalism, which certain elements of the ANC and Black trade union movements do adopt. So. Um, thanks, Henry. Um, we have uh, um, Russell Grinker up next, and then I'm also going to um, uh, ask a couple of questions, and I'll keep my eye out for any further questions. Just to note, I know we're on two hours now. Um, I think we'll go for another 10 or so minutes. Um, but obviously, if people need to leave, then they need to leave. But it'll be great uh, if you can still stay on the platform. Um, and if I'm committing any of um, the speakers to staying on the platform and they need to speak, just drop me a direct message. Russell, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for some very interesting uh, uh, inputs. Um, I think an interesting thing to recall is that the, the First World War was also an enormous challenge to what had been an international working class movement. And if we recall, it led to the split of the, well, the, of the second international into, into uh, what became the third international and internationalist faction, as opposed to the majority of the social democratic parties in Europe and elsewhere, which supported uh, taking sides with, uh, ruling classes in, in, in the uh, protagonists in, this, in the First World War. So, I mean, that, that had an enormous influence on the kind of politics that arose after the, after the uh, war was over. And it, uh, somebody mentioned uh, Eddie Rue's book, Rebel Pity, which uh, has a lot of interesting material on the influences of other strands of social democracy on what became uh, left-wing movements in South Africa. And, that fed into the into the into the uh, eventual formation of the CPSA, uh, many of which were were filled with all sorts of European social chauvinism, uh, which I think persisted to some extent in in the in the early Communist Party, and uh, I, I think I, I don't recall where it's I think it's in Rue's book also, where he describes fights between um, black members of the Communist Party and Jewish members of the Communist Party over the common turns, various turns, physical fights, literally, uh, 
Um, so there, there were a lot of problems that fed into the early Communist Party, which were not resolved. And the, the Third International, uh, for the very short period uh, that it actually was able to uh, influence the world communist movement with any kind of genuinely progressive internationalist politics before it became a, an institution to defend Stalin, uh, was was a very new organization as well and uh, didn't really have the resources to influence uh, many of the parties around the world which themselves were very new and and very weak and uh, I think uh, what's been said about these the early CPSA demonstrates that as well um, it was the people were working under very difficult circumstances under very repressive circumstances and the the influence of the of the of the Russian Revolution was only quite remote, uh, quite frankly, in in many of these organisations. So I think I think we have to take quite a balanced view of these things. But the, the Rue book has some very interesting stuff on where on, on the various British strands, and, and I think Lucian mentioned the SDF as one, but there were some which SDF was quite radical. Um, but there were some which were much more British chauvinist, which fed into the whole stra stream of, of left politics in South Africa as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'll come in now with um, my question, which uh, I think was sparked off by some of what Lucien was saying earlier about um, the nature of the historiography um, on the Communist Party in South Africa. And I've been um, um, in the belly of the voluntary association beast um, um, for the last couple of weeks in terms of my research, and I'm talking about small associations. So we've mentioned quite a lot of them during the conversation so far today, uh, soccer clubs, um, debating societies, um, uh, different ethnic associations. So um, I'm speaking about the proliferation of smaller organizations where, where um, associational um, coherence is often more about location than it is about any common set of views. And I wonder if one of the things that um, is holding one of the things that strikes me about um, the literature on the early CPSA is that it's assumed to be a, a fairly unified and um, theoretically and ideologically consistent movement throughout, yet the conversations today have indicated that it was anything but. And what does it say for us, and this takes into account the conversation about um, needing to think outside of South Africa's urban locations. What does it say if we start not to think in terms of the early CPSA as one unified organization, some of whom are supportive of issues like, um, you know, a native republic and some of whom are not, but rather see it as actually mirroring what is very clearly evident in the uh, political landscape, and I'm talking P with a small P, of the early 20th century, especially after the Great War, where what you have is a proliferation of organizations which appear to have more in common um, than in fact um, they actually do. So that's a, a, a very broad question. And perhaps it's um, something that we can pick up uh, along with some of the other issues that have come up today for the further sessions. Um, and may I just remind you that the next session um, in this panel is on the 24th of August. Um, uh, and, and finally, just one point, and there have been a couple of mentions of Umtateli uh, Wabantu today, and uh, one of the things that I noticed didn't come up was a discussion of the Rand Revolt, uh, and I happened to read the other day that many of the, um, I mean, and there's really interesting stuff in Umtateli about the relationship between Black workers and the Rand Revolt, not all of it in English. Um, and I happened to read the other day about how many of the Umtateli subscribers were really furious um, um, uh, towards the end of February because they weren't getting their regular doses of Umtateli. I mean, it's a weekly, so we're not talking that frequently because their offices had been blockaded by um, 
uh, some of the, the, the white labor forces uh, who were protesting up against government measures. And this has meant that the new newspaper uh, couldn't go to print. So one of their great grievances uh, with the Rand revolt had to do with um, lack of access to uh, the weekly dose of Umtateli news. Um, there are no other hands up. I wonder if the, um, you don't have to, but the participants from today, if you've got any further comments, um, mm -hmm. if you would like um, to respond, otherwise we can move to wrapping up what has been, I think a really interesting and, and, and really worthwhile comment. I see your hand, Peter, a literal hand, and that makes me so happy. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is also distill some of the comments that have come up today to so, so, so that um, Ariana Lassoni, who's uh, hosting the next session, can pull them into her session, because the idea is to try and get a conversation going over the many different um, seminars um, that are part of this commemoration of um, the SACP. So Lucien wants to speak, I can see, and... Um, uh, Peter, Peter, do you want to go? Yeah, on this question of the historiography, I think it's an excellent one. And my first sentence was, without being too provincial, and my task was to write a provincial history of the Communist Party without being provincial in brackets. Uh, Ariana is the only one amongst us who's really uh, written a, a regional history, uh, in this case of the ANC with, uh, with Bernard and others. But we have to go back to people like uh, Edgar Brooks in his history of Natal. So you have to think about the building blocks. If you look at the historiography, say, of China or of France, there are innumerable histories of the Communist Party in Limoges or Bordeaux or Liège or whatever, Lille. Uh, and yet what we, and you're all trapped in it tonight. You're all talking about these discourses of Stalinism and the CPA was doing this about imperialism and this and that, and yet what was happening on the ground? So to, to, to find out what was happening on the ground, and we've seen this far more complex mosaic as all of the speakers have outlined, it, it is complicated. So we need uh, provincial histories, we need city histories of the ANC, of the Liberal Party, of the Communist Party, of the ICU. We have new graduate students coming through, new postgrads coming through. And so people have to refocus, I think, on place. And when we get that richness, then we can talk about, oh, yes. And Bongani at UJ is doing this with his work on Champion. And uh, so the fact that we don't have biographies of people like Champion or, or Mote or Malkinson, it's a tragedy. And, and professors should not push their uh, PhD students away from biography and push them into something more lucrative like cultural history with, you know, all due apologies to Peter lurking there with his wonderful work on, on soccer and football. But we do need to get a balance with those regional histories, not just of villages. And there's been some excellent histories of mission uh, villages and small towns. We need those too. Uh, so I think what we need to do is go and reproduce, reproduce historians. I think your mic's off, Natasha. Thanks. Lucien, you wanted to say something. Yeah, Thanks no, it's just, it's just a quick thing. I think this is also, uh, speaking of, in terms of historiography, why, why it's important to also look back at some of these. A lot of the history of the party has been written, um, you know, about the big ideological issues, but there's some very fine uh, work, social history work, and I, I think that will draw a lot. I mean, Peter Delius's stuff looking at the links between the CPSA and migrants in Sikakuni land. But with that in mind, it also enriches how we understand the early party or its predecessors like the SDF, the Industrial Socialist League. I mean, the, the, the SDF had a socialist choir, uh, Wilfred Harrison, the, the anarchist guy in there. He had his son christened at a, a ceremony of a socialist christening. 
at the socialist hall. Um, the Industrial Socialist League has socialist Sunday schools. So it, I think there was quite a big effort as well by a lot of these left movements. And Henry pointed to this with the ICU's rugby team to also occupy that, that space. And that's something you see a lot in European socialism where the old German social Democrats had bars and gyms and bicycle clubs. So I think that's also a fruitful area. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, uh, just again, um, thank you for your participation today. And just a reminder that this is um, uh, one, the first of an ongoing set of seminars and it is, let me see if I can get them all right, jointly organized by um, the University of Johannesburg, um, uh, Department of History. This is like, um, you know, thanks to the producers um, by History Workshop at WITS. Um, it's by um, uh, 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 Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, um, also um, the University of Cape Town, and very importantly, the South African um, South African History Online um, with Omar Badsha. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at some of our future events. And um, I think that these are really interesting conversations. Um, so take care, everyone. And if you're uh, in our part of the world, um, stay warm. If you're somewhere in the world, which is really, really cool, I hope um, uh, um, your hot weather continues because when it gets cold, you're going to be wishing for it back. All right. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.